Hermann Hesse, Steppenwolf. Solitude is independence. It had been my wish, and with the years I had attained it. It was cold. Oh, cold enough. But it was also still, wonderfully still and vast, like the cold stillness of space in which the stars revolve. You are willing to die, you coward, but not to live. There is no reality except the one contained within us. That is why so many people live such an unreal life. They take the images outside of them for reality and never allow the world within to assert itself. In eternity, there is no time, only an instant long enough for a joke. For what I always hated and detested and cursed above all things was this contentment, this healthiness and comfort, this carefully preserved optimism of the middle classes, this fat and prosperous brood of mediocrity. When I have neither pleasure nor pain and have been breathing for a while the lukewarm insipid air of these so-called good and tolerable days, I feel so bad in my childish soul that I smash my moldering lyre of thanksgiving in the face of the slumbering god of contentment and would rather feel the very devil burn in me than this warmth of a well-heated room. A wild longing for strong emotions and sensations seethes in me, a rage against this toneless, flat, normal, and sterile life. I have a mad impulse to smash something, a warehouse perhaps, or a cathedral, or myself, to commit outrages, to pull off the wigs of a few revered idols. Most men will not swim before they are able to. Is that not witty? Naturally, they won't swim. They are born for the solid earth, not for the water. And naturally, they won't think. They are made for life, not for thought. Yes, and he who thinks, what's more, he who makes thought his business, he may go far in it, but he has bartered the solid earth for the water all the same, and one day he will drown. I am in truth the steppenwolf that I often call myself, that beast astray that finds neither home nor joy nor nourishment in a world that is strange and incomprehensible to him. A wild longing for strong emotions and sensations seethes in me, a rage against this toneless, flat, normal and sterile life. I have a mad impulse to smash something, a warehouse perhaps, or a cathedral, or myself, to commit outrages. There are always a few such people who demand the utmost of life and yet cannot come to terms with its stupidity and crudeness. Or how absurd these words are, such as beast and beast of prey. One should not speak of animals in that way. They may be terrible sometimes, but they're much more right than men. They're never in any embarrassment. They always know what to do and how to behave themselves. They don't flatter and they don't intrude. They don't pretend. They are as they are, like stones or flowers or stars in the sky. You should not take old people who are already dead seriously. It does them injustice. We immortals do not like things to be taken seriously. We like joking. Seriousness, young man, is an accident of time. It consists, I don't mind telling you in confidence, in putting too high a value on time. I, too, once put too high a value on time. For that reason, I wish to be a hundred years old. In eternity, however, there is no time, you see. Eternity is a mere moment, just long enough for a joke. How foolish it is to wear oneself out in vain longing for warmth. Solitude is independence. I want to tell you something today, something that I have known for a long while, and you know it too, but perhaps you have never said it to yourself. I am going to tell you now what it is that I know about you and me and our fate. You, Harry, have been an artist and a thinker, a man full of joy and faith, always on the track of what is great and eternal, never content with the trivial and petty. But the more life has awakened you and brought you back to yourself, the greater has you need been, and the deeper the sufferings and dread and despair that have overtaken you, till you were up to your neck in them. And all that you once knew and loved and revered as beautiful and sacred, all the belief you once had in mankind and our high destiny, has been of no avail and has lost its worth and gone to pieces. Your faith found no more air to breathe. 
and suffocation is a hard death. Is that true, Harry? Is that your fate? But it's a poor fellow who can't take his pleasure without asking other people's permission. I do want more. I am not content with being happy. I was not made for it. It is not my destiny. My destiny is the opposite. His life oscillates, as everyone's does, not merely between two poles, such as the body and the spirit, the saint and the sinner, but between thousands and thousands. Every age, every culture, every custom and tradition has its own character, its own weakness and its own strength, its beauties and ugliness, accepts certain sufferings as matters, of course, puts up patiently with certain evils. Human life is reduced to real suffering, to hell, only when two ages, two cultures, and religions overlap. Now there are times when a whole generation is caught in this way between two ages, two modes of life, with the consequence that it loses all power to understand itself and has no standard, no security, no simple acquiescence. Naturally, everyone does not feel this equally strongly. I cannot understand what pleasures and joys they are that drive people to the overcrowded railways and hotels, into the packed cafes with the suffocating and oppressive music, to the bars and variety entertainments, to world exhibitions, to the corsos. I cannot understand nor share these joys, though they are within my reach, for which thousands of others strive. On the other hand, what happens to me in my rare hours of joy, what for me is bliss and life and ecstasy and exaltation, the world in general seeks at most in imagination. In life it finds it absurd. And in fact, if the world is right, if this music of the cafes, these mass enjoyments and these Americanized men who are pleased with so little are right, then I am wrong, I am crazy. I am in truth the Steppenwolf that I often call myself, that beast astray who finds neither home nor joy nor nourishment in a world that is strange and incomprehensible to him. Once it happened, as I lay awake at night, that I suddenly spoke in verses, in verses so beautiful and strange that I did not venture to think of writing them down, and then in the morning they vanished, and yet they lay hidden within me, like the hard kernel within an old brittle husk. A wild longing for strong emotions and sensations seethes in me, a rage against this toneless, flat, normal and sterile life. The mistaken and unhappy notion that a man is an enduring unity is known to you. It is also known to you that a man consists of a multitude of souls, of numerous selves, the separation of the unity of the personality into these numerous pieces passes for madness. Science has invented the name schizomania for it. Science is in this so far right as no multiplicity may be dealt with unless there be a series, a certain order and grouping. It is wrong in so far as it holds that one only and binding lifelong order is possible for the multiplicity of subordinate selves. This error of science has many unpleasant consequences, and the single advantage of simplifying the work of the state-appointed pastors and masters and saving them the labors of original thought. In consequence of this error, many persons pass for normal, and indeed for highly valuable members of society, who are incurably mad. And many, on the other hand, are looked upon as mad who are geniuses. This is the art of life. You may yourself as an artist develop the game of your life and lend it animation. You may complicate and enrich it as you please. It lies in your hands. Just as madness, in a higher sense, is the beginning of all wisdom, so is schizomania the beginning of all art and all fantasy. A. Now, true humor begins when a man ceases to take himself seriously. A. I would traverse not once more but often the hell of my inner being. One day I would be a better hand at the game. One day I would learn how to laugh. Pablo was waiting for me, and Mozart too. In fear I hurried this way and that. I had the taste of blood and chocolate in my mouth, the one as hateful as the other. 
Man is an onion made up of a hundred integuments, a texture made up of many threads. The ancient Asiatics knew this well enough, and in the Buddhist yoga, an exact technique was devised for unmasking the illusion of the personality. The human merry-go-round sees many changes. The illusion that cost India the efforts of thousands of years to unmask is the same illusion that the West has labored just as hard to maintain and strengthen.